Yeah, really excited to dive into God's word today um, and continue our Better Story series. Our word for 2024 has been what? Love to hear it. Better. We're, we're looking at the better way that Jesus offers to us. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, what Jesus offers us is not just behavior management. He offers us a better way of doing life. A better way. And that's what we're seeing as, as we looked at you know, Luke 10. We see the two different ladies in Scripture that I, that I believe show for us a model of living. The way of Mary is the better way, where she was with Jesus, but chose to be attentive, listening, and focused. And then there was Martha, who was there in the same room that Mary was, but she was distracted, worried, and upset. Those are two different ways that we can choose to follow Jesus, the cultural way or the kingdom way. And we're saying, Lord, how can we live in this kingdom way? And so we're looking at people in Scripture who modeled and lived this better way. But also, too, looking at what you know, things that are going to be a part of our stories as humans and followers of Jesus. Jesus. And today we're going to look at the better story of Lazarus. Better story of Lazarus. So if you know anything about the Bible, scripture, or anything, you know this is the story where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And typically when you look at that story, that's, that's what you focus on, is the fact that God, or, or that Jesus raised a dead man from the grave. So whenever we sing that song and we say there is resurrection life where where you go, this is one of the places we see that. But we're actually going to look at the story from kind of a different lens today. And um, we're going to dive into that in just a second. But I wanted to start off um, by just giving you a couple thoughts. Number one, um, I feel like I preach this a lot because I feel like, number one, we need to hear it a lot. Because in the midst of life, when life be lifing, anybody life been lifing? <laughs> life, life be lifing. Um, we need to be reminded of Romans 8, 28 that says, we know that in all things, everyone say all, all things. All things. You know, in the Greek, all things means all things. <laughs> right? We know that in all things, God works. So God, God, is, God is a crafter. He's a worker. Like God works for the good. Everyone say good. For the good of those who love him, right? So we need to be reminded all things work to the good. But what I love about this verse is that it doesn't say that all things are good. And that's what I love about God is he doesn't call bad good or good bad, right? So this verse doesn't say, hey, everything that happens in your life is good. So God's going to work it for the good. So be quiet. No, he says, hey, God will take all things, the good, the bad, the ugly, the peaks, the valleys, the highs, the lows, the good times, the bad times, and make it work for the good of those who love him, right? So this is what as followers of Jesus we understand, is that there are going to be some things in life that happen that are not good, but we believe that God is so good, he can take all things and make it work for our good and for his glory if we let him. Okay? And what, what I think this ultimately leads into is this truth, is that every season of life is sacred to God. Every season of life is sacred to God, meaning that there is not a season in your life that you are walking through that the Lord cannot make a holy place where you meet with him. Well, the air turned on and knocked out. This. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought I heard something go off, and this went out, and I was like, I guess that went out too, but it didn't. We're all good. Okay, sorry. I just freaked out over, over nothing. But um, there is not a season of your life that the Lord does not want to meet you in, right? And because I, I, I think what ends up happening is if we're in a good season, we're like, I'll meet the Lord there. If we're in a season of loss, if we're in a season of pain, we're, we're, we're like, that makes us run away from the Lord instead of to him. And, I, and, and, I, and, and so I, I think what I want to consistently invite our church into is realizing every season has an opportunity for you to find, meet, grow closer with, and see a side of God that you would not normally see. That's why I love Paul's story in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul has, he calls it the thorn in his flesh. Everyone had a, anyone ever had a thorn in their flesh? Yeah. Right, and I love how the thorn isn't named. He just says a thorn. So I'd be putting people there. I got a thorn in my flesh named Jackson Judah Dallas. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. no, but, but it's, it's like, got a thorn in my flesh. You know, Paul says, I, I, I had a thorn. He said, I prayed for God to take it away. And God, says, you know what? Jesus said, like Paul wrote down, Jesus, he wrote the words in red. He said, Jesus told me no. If I was Paul, I'd be upset. Like I'd be planting all these churches for you. Almost got murdered for you, killed for you. I just got a simple thorn. You can't even take that away. But what Jesus responded with, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. He said, 
my power is made perfect in your weakness. So Paul's reaction to that thorn began as take it away. By the end of it, Paul was saying, I'm thankful for the thorns I tried to pray away. Why? Because it made me see a, God, a side of God's grace, power, and strength that I would have never seen if I didn't have a thorn. That's why every season is sacred, and that's why you have to be careful about praying away a season the Lord wants to be invited into. That's why it takes discernment. That, that's why prayer is about discernment, because if we're not comfortable, we will pray, we will pray for comfort instead of growth. And that's why even Jesus, he had these moments. That's why I love, you need to read about Jesus because we're gonna get to that in just a sec. Because even when Jesus, when he was in the garden, God, there's a way, God the Father, there's a way for you to take this away from me, take it away, but not my will, your will be done. It was as if Jesus was saying, this is what my flesh wants, but this is what I know, God, you want. And I'm gonna be honest with you about what I don't want, but I'm gonna submit to what you do want. That's powerful. And as followers of Jesus, Every season is sacred, even the seasons that we have thorns and that we have loss. And this is especially challenging in the United States. Because you are in a, and you've heard me use this language, you are in a crock pot in the United States of being cooked in the American dream and the American way of doing things. Where Forgive me here, but it's like I kind of feel we kind of are cooked in this. We deserve blessing. We deserve a comfortable life. We deserve ease. We deserve, like, and it's because it's in, you know, it's kind of in the vision statement for the country. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? So I'm not saying it's bad, but what I am saying as a follower of Jesus, every follower of Jesus has to look at the culture it's being, it's being grown up in because if it's not careful, the gospel will mix with culture. When we're not called to mix with culture, kingdom people are called to make, are part of a different culture. And we're called to influence the culture we're in. So if you are in the United States, you will be tempted to think you deserve comfort, you deserve blessing, so if that is this, the, the thought of your life, maybe consciously or subconsciously, and this is um, reinforced by a lot of things we experience, especially on social media. So then we end up comparing our lives to not the life of Jesus, but the life of people on social media. So then you're like, man, I mean, just think about what social media is. Social media is, the purpose of it is to get you to compare. Comparison is the thief of joy. If you want to immediately throw away anything good in your life, compare it. If you want to immediately go from gratefulness to grumbling, compare. And this is what social media inevitably does. So we see where everyone's traveling that we're not. We see a spouse that we don't have. Well, I wish my wife did that. Like my ones that I want to punch, but it's a, that's strong language are moms that, that are like, life with four kids as a mom. And they're like, all their kids are well-behaved, eating their breakfast. I'm like, I don't know where that happens, but it don't happen in the warehouse. You know, but, but it's just like, it can get you thinking like, oh man, I wish I traveled there. I wish I had that job. I wish I had that life. I wish I went, I wish I had that car. I wish I had this house. I wish I had this, 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 this. Do you see what I'm saying? but it can make you subconsciously think you deserve and want a certain kind of life. So then when you compare it to the life in reality you have, a lot of things can come up. And that's why I think it's important that as followers of Jesus, we compare our life not to what people in our culture, but we compare our lives to one comparison, and that's Jesus. Because if you're comparing your life to someone in culture, when you hit a loss or when you hit a hard time, you'll have this, but I don't deserve this, right? But if you compare your life to Jesus, what you'll actually see is like, dang. Because Jesus shows us, he's a savior, he's our Lord, but he's also our example. Jesus shows us what the path looks like to do the will of the Father. And it's not paved with cupcakes. 
I'm just hungry. It's not paved with ease and comfort. It's paved with submission. It's paved with surrender. It's paved with a lot of humanness. It's paved with that. And I just feel like really challenged to share that with you because here's, 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 here's the thing, right? In, um, interpreting what happens in your life through the life of Jesus, not American culture, right? So that's kind of the big thought. Because here's the, the thing, right? If, if, like, interpreting your life, what happens in your life is just as important as what happens in your life. Some of y'all, that's going to hit on Monday. We said, interpreting what happens in your life is just as important as what happens in your life. Because what we see in, in the life of Jesus is that he has things happen, but when things happen, you, we can see how he handled them and dealt with them and processed them and ultimately moved through as being fully God and fully man and what he invites us into. Because if we're not comparing it with that and we're comparing it to what culture says, y'all, we're gonna be barreled down with a lot of unhealthy expectations that are gonna lead that whenever you experience a loss, you're gonna think, God doesn't love me, where's he at? And that's what we're actually going to focus on today when we're talking about these better stories and Lazarus. It's not that the Lazarus was raised from the dead, but the circumstances that were surrounding the death of Lazarus. And what you actually see is that there is a lot of grief. There's a lot of grief. And what I really felt led to talk about today is how do we grieve loss in a God-honoring way? How do we grieve loss in a God-honoring way? Now, I hope for some of you this isn't triggering. If it is, I apologize. I probably should have sent a message out. No, that's what I'm preaching on. But I just really felt led to speak about this because it's many times not a lot of what we talk about in church. Many times what we talk about in church is just how you can get over stuff quick and keep it moving. But how many of you know grief doesn't always work that way? Processing loss is not always easy. And it can even be a, the a theological shakeup. I remember when I was at my first youth pastor, pastor spot in a town called Horseheads, New York. Dumbest name for a city I've ever heard. But if you're from Horseheads, it's the greatest name. We love you. Anybody here from Horseheads, New York? I didn't think so, but I figured I'd check. But um, so I was at a really hyper faith Pentecostal church. And I don't know, is this like 2007, 2008, where it was more of a prosperity gospel church. I didn't know it at the time, but now that I look back on it, it was very prosperity gospel oriented. And there was a song that they would sing. It was called Blessed Be Your Name. Anybody remember that song? Blessed be your name. Sung by Matt Redmond, the guy from, uh, from Britain. So it was like, blessed be your name. And a lion, you know, it's kind of had that little vibe to it. But there was a bridge in the song that said, you give and take away. You give and take, and the song was based on the life of Job. You give and take away, but it says, my heart will choose to say, blessed be your name. And when they were singing that song, they would take the bridge out. Because they'd be like, God don't take away nothing. He only adds. You shall prosper, right? So, so be, why? Because they didn't want to see God as being a God that would encounter experience loss. He's an adder. And I just wanted to see, I was the youth pastor. I couldn't really say anything. You know how youth pastors be. It's like, go in there and do stuff with the youth, you know. Not at our church, though. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but at that church, it was, it was, it was like they just saw, like, no, nah, God don't, and we, we ain't even going to sing about that. And I think it's interesting how, you know, at that church, they didn't sing about that, but maybe how has that been indoctrinated into your spiritual DNA? Where you're like, no, as Christians, we don't experience loss. And, 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 but then when you experience loss and you experience a reality different from your theology, how do you handle that? And what I have, have seen and experienced many times, Christians are not very good at grieving. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and I decided to reach out to a therapist in our church whom I deeply respect, 
and ask her, hey, can you give me some thoughts from your experiences about what, why Christians struggle with grieving? Like the process of loss. And before we dive into the text in John 11, I wanted to just share these with you. Number one, a few reasons why Jesus followers struggle with grieving. She said this, number one, many Christians do not have a healthy relationship with emotions. How true is that? Because you, you were taught, you renewed, your, you know, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we, so we look at the heart and your emotions as being the enemy. And I've even taught this, like in, in my unhealthy state, it was like emotions and feelings were the complete enemy. You just need to block them out and operate with your mind and faith. And when you actually look at scripture, scripture is filled with people processing and sharing emotions. And it's absolutely true, emotions, we should not be completely led by them, but they are good information givers. And what I've seen in the church is you can deny them. So, it's your, so you're feeling a certain, certain way. Nope, just ain't even gonna feel that. So you kind of just stuff it. It ain't even there. I got the feeling. Nope, ain't going there. So you either deny or you're dominated by emotions. Right? So then you got people that are like only being led by what they feel. And I don't know about you, like that is not the best way to follow Jesus because I don't always feel like loving people. Anyone else here? I don't always feel like tithing. I don't always feel like giving my time away. Right? So feelings, we don't want to deny them, but we don't want to be dominated by them. So what's the goal? Is to, be, is to let Jesus disciple them and sanctify them. That's what we're called to be and do as followers of Jesus. That's, that's why at our church we said we want you to be holistic followers of Jesus. Mind, body, soul, spirit. Meaning that Jesus just doesn't want to get you to do the right things. He wants to fill every piece of your humanity and be invited into every piece of humanity and to what C.S. Lewis called the full treatment. Jesus just uh, just doesn't want to give you a shot to get you to feel better. Jesus wants to literally be invited and fill your mind, your heart, your soul, your spirit, your emotions, and have you be discipled by them. So you're not dominated by your emotions, but you don't deny them either. Are y'all seeing what I'm saying? And this is the good news. So it's true, many of us don't have a healthy relationship with emotions. Number two, though. Some think grief is something to overcome instead of a process that needs to be journeyed through. My wife and I, we we went to a grief workshop at a place locally um, at a counseling center that was very informative and really helped us out, and and they showed this. They said, this is how we want grief to work. This is how grief actually works. Right? Where many times, you know, especially being a, like me, I just want to push through and, you know, whatever, just keep it moving. Like when my mom passed, it, it, I, I wanted that to happen, but it looked a lot like that. I'd be driving down the road a couple months, three, four months, you know, even a couple years later, I'm just driving down. <sighs> I'm like, no, nah, I don't want that wave. I don't want that wave. But, it, you know, how, how many of you, like when you have a loss and you experience loss, it's like you're going to have a wave, waves of grief. And many times you're going to want to try to damn the wave and get away from the wave and curse the wave when really you need to, by God's grace, learn to ride the wave. And it's not always going to be a a straight line, right? Number three, though, she said this, the grief process is vulnerable and can be ugly. Everyone say ugly. Christians try to shortcut it with good answers. Y'all know y'all have good Christian friends that when they visit you when you're in a loss, they say things like, this too shall pass. It's not even in the Bible. <laughs> Maybe the principle is, but that ain't even in the Bible. Right? Or, or they'll try to say nice scriptures, you know, like, and, and, and those are true. They're not saying they're not true, but when you lose something, it can be an exposing experience. And it can be ugly because maybe, you, you know, like, and, and 
I was about to say, it, it can be ugly and very revealing, and many times we as human beings struggle with vulnerability. Number four, some may spiritually bypass the grief journey and hyper-focus on the hope we have in Jesus because that's all they know to do or they do not want to feel the negative emotions. We're going to talk more about this, but um, having hope is so vital when you are grieving, but at the same time, if you bypass grief just to get to hope, you bypass a very important process that God, who made you and created you, put in place to help you heal. Amen? Amen. Next, some may believe that the grief process is limited to death and not loss, transition, change, unmet expectations, et cetera, and therefore don't realize they need to grieve. Some of you have devalued things you've lost, and it's affecting what you're doing right now because you haven't grieved it. Everyone doing okay? And it's really true because we just think of grieving as as like, well, I lost somebody I love, but maybe you had a dream that you were expecting to see happen and that didn't happen. I didn't realize my dad dealt with this for a while. My dad lived, you know, put 20 years into a company expecting in his mid-40s to be retired and well off. And when he was 40, the rug got swept out. And I remember that portion of my life, he, he was just very weird and disconnected. And I never knew why. And then I'm like, I look back and I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. Lastly, We are so busy, distracted, uh, we don't have time to grieve. We have to function, we have jobs, we have kids, we have expectations, right? Some are like, I ain't got time for this. And that can be hard, right? So, these are some of the challenges we have. I don't say this to say hopeless, I say this now to turn our eyes to the text in John 11, where we're going to see... What, 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 like what I pray is as we walk through this, you will see Jesus gives you permission to grieve. And this is Jesus, the, the, like this is Jesus, the, the God man, right? So let's, let's look at this story. Hopefully um, we put the other scriptures in there, did we? Yes, okay, because I totally gave them the wrong scriptures last service. That was on me. Um, but let me set this up for you is, Jesus knew that Lazarus was sick. He knew a couple days before, but Jesus, he was in a city. He heard that Lazarus was sick. He waited a couple days within the city and then came, and by the time he got there, he was already dead. So Mary and Martha, who were Lazarus's sisters, were like all up in a tizzy and really upset. And so Jesus is encountering them when they're in this tizzy. And so this is where we're gonna pick up on, on the story. So Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises. At the last day, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assured, or they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep, so they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Jesus did what? Wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. So we see here Jesus encountering his friend dying. And his response was not to go to the part of the story we know and love. Lazarus, rise. How many of you remember the Carmen song? Yes. Lazarus. Yes. Is that Steph? Yes. Okay, Steph. Okay, Steph. You were probably the last person I was to know, know that. That's how I knew you grew up in church. <laughs> Lazarus, come forth. But we see here Jesus encounters the loss of somebody he loves. And before he goes to healing, 
there's a process. And I just want to share a couple thoughts with you that I see from, 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 uh, from this. Number one. Can you all put that up, please? Whatever the first point is, the one after the next slide. Looking at my notes, I don't remember where, where, where it's at. Yeah, so here you, you see most stages of grief that are present here. So you've got denial, right? You've got denial going on where Mary and Martha are shocked and they're like, they can't believe that their brother is gone. Anger, right? What does it say? A deep anger welled up within who? Jesus. It doesn't say what he was angry about, but when he got around grieving people, that's when the anger started to well. Bargaining, right? You had someone say, well, Jesus, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened, right? Do y'all see the stages here? Depression, Jesus wept. Acceptance. It says later in the text that Mary says, he's been in the grave four days, Jesus. Why are you even gonna go in there? It's gonna stink. There's been this acceptance. And these are some of the stages that we see surrounding this. That I'm sure in your loss, whatever you lost, you're going to feel this. It's, it's, it's going to happen. And just know you're not, like, this is called part of the process. But I also want to make some observations here that I see that Jesus did. Because like I said, I, I want you to have permission that you see the Son of God walking through here when he experiences loss. Number one, Jesus had the right theology. Duh. LOL. And still got angry, was troubled, and wept. How many times do we try to stuff what we feel because we have the right answers? Jesus told her, I'm the resurrection and the life. He told her, yo bro gonna rise again. And she's like, I know he's gonna rise at the resurrection. So she had right theology. Jesus was teaching right theology. So Jesus had the right answers before he went in and experienced the loss. But even while he was experiencing the loss, what ended up happening is it did not keep him from feeling anger, from hurt, and ultimately weeping. Here's the thought. Right theology and biblical answers shouldn't keep us from feeling and processing our feelings, hurt, and pain. Because some of you will dismiss that stuff because you're like, God's in charge, he's, he's, he's not, which these are all true. They need to be said. They need to be stated. They need to be known as truths. But biblical truths are not a way for us to devalue or deny the feelings we're having. It should actually create a safe place for us to process them. Second thing that I see is before Jesus brought healing, he wept. Healing usually takes place after grieving and weeping. I believe there are some of you that are desiring to see healing from a loss, but you're trying to circumvent the process. And, and I think one of the major reasons is for this is because it's hard for us in the United States to understand process because everything is an app we download. So we are being culturally trained for quickness when realizing a lot of the things we experience in our life as a human in our relationship with Jesus are not quick. So we go to Chipotle and get 10 pound burrito, which I'm doing after the service. <laughs> I can't wait. But we go in there and walk out with food that we had no part in the process of making. We were not there when the farmers planted the seeds, when they were slaughtering the animals. Sorry, animals. Thank you for, for the steak. The, you know, the lettuce, the sour cream, the tomatoes, they all just did not appear. There was a farmer that grew it, that planted it, that harvested it, that processed it, that shipped it to Chipotle. And all we do is walk in, bowl, rice, beans, queso, tomatoes, <laughs> so, right? We just state it and we're given it and have no idea of the process. This is what we try to do with spiritual things. I want, sanct I want sanctification. I want love. I want joy. I want peace. I want this grief to be done. You see what I'm saying? And this stuff 
subconsciously becomes the expectations we have when it comes to things in the spirit. But y'all, let me warn you, that, that's not how love is grown, by just demanding it at a counter. Grief is the same way. Grief, grief is a process that must be walked through, that you go through, that as you go through the process, that's when you normally experience healing. And healing doesn't mean everything becomes okay. Healing means you're learning to live with the loss. Are y'all seeing this? Just a few things from this story here. I want to tra- transition from the story into, I think, a principle that I, th- that I really believe is, is like, how is a follower of Jesus? Because re- here's the thing. I wanted you to get permission and a model for the necessity and importance of grieving from this story. Because I think sometimes all, all we need is permission. You know what I'm saying? Like, just to know the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus was fully God yet fully man and walked through so you can know you're not crazy. That's one of the things why God just didn't give a word, he sent his son. Why? Because he didn't want you to feel crazy. He wanted someone to live in the same kind of body you have, deal with the same things. That's why, that's why Hebrews 4 is so, is so powerful. We do not have a high priest who was unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way we were yet was without sin. Then he says, let us then approach the throne of grace with boldness. And present our, our request because we have a Jesus that's been there, done that. And that will walk with us through grief. And I want to go to 1 Thessalonians 4. We're going to end here. So it says, Paul's writing to a church he planted in Thessalonica. He says, as brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So that you do not do what? You do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no what? There's two powerful words here, grieve and hope. I love what Paul says here. He he says, hey, I don't want you to be uninformed about what happens to people when they die, so you just won't grieve, you'll just suck it up. He says, no, I, I don't want you to be uninformed like those who don't know Christ, so when you grieve, you won't just grieve worldly grief, you will grieve with what? Hope. And when I was praying about the best tool that, it's not the only tool, but it's one of the tools that I think as far as being followers of Jesus that we can realize we are invited to by him is we just don't grieve, we grieve with hope. One of the things that I believe Christians struggle with is the idea of both and. The two realities can be true at the same time. And both realities are actually needed. Let me give you an example grace and truth, right? Scripture tells us Jesus came, John chapter one, full of grace and full of truth. Not just grace or truth, grace and truth. Meaning both of them are needed. And I don't know about you, this is absolutely needed in your life. Where you are gonna have people, and what I, and what I find that happens is normally a grace person marries a truth person. And a truth person marries a grace person. This is true for my wife and I. And this is so true when, when, when we're raising kids. I'm the truth guy. My wife is the grace one. Y'all know how it is, right? Moms, love y'all. But y'all be giving way too much grace. I'm just saying from my house, I got 13, 10, and 8. They, they going to take advantage of that grace. So sometimes they, they need a little truth in their life. They need a, a little truth. But I'm grateful for my wife's grace because if the, her grace wasn't added in, into parenting and into our relationship, I would do what scripture says. I would exasperate my kids because I'd give them too much truth. Because my job with the, like, I know my boys, they need pain and consequence to grow as a man. But my, you know, I'm, I'm glad that my wife is, is like, oh, you, you know, how, how do you want your sandwich cut? How much peanut butter do you want on the sandwich? How much jelly do you want? And they know when dad's home, you got a brain, you got access to the fridge. Make your own sandwich. Because <laughs> I'm trying to help them learn how to be a sandwich maker. 
Not just make a sandwich for, for them. No, I'm, I'm not, you know, of course, I'm, I don't, you know, but I can, that, that is my natural bend. Anyone else here? More of a truth guy, but then you got the grace. But what you realize is you don't, you need both. And here's the thing, you need to recognize where your home base is. Because if you don't recognize where your home base is, you can't grow in what your home base isn't. I've had to grow in grace. And the way you grow in something is you receive it. So as I recognize how much the grace of God I need, I'm able to give grace because I receive grace. You see what I'm, you see what I'm saying? True, you know, grace people, you know, grace is really cool, but grace needs some guardrails because grace can easily be abused, right? And, 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 and so, but, so you've got a home base because you've got some people in church, they'll be like, people struggle, they come from different backgrounds, there's, you know, and, and they will grace themselves away into sin. And that's where you need the truth tellers of like, hey, God is gracious, but he also has a standard. This can even happen in church, right? Like, you know, God's grace, but this is what God's word says. And you know what? We need both. We don't need separate churches like that. Because unfortunately, you have grace churches and truth churches. I'm like, why can't we be a grace and truth church? Where you realize you have a home base, but you need to grow in the home base that you're not. So if you're grace, you need to learn some truth. If you're truth, you, learn, you, you need to learn some grace. This is the tension that Christians live in. Another tension is this, faith and reality. You've got hyper-faith people and hyper-reality people, right? Me, I'm a hyper-reality person. Like, this is what it is. This is probably what God wanted. But then you've got hyper-faith people that are like, God could do anything. Let's storm heaven. You know, like, I've got pastor friends, right, that are really hyper-faith faith people, right? So I got one friend He's like, bro, we ain't got no money, we ain't got no people, but God said, we're moving forward. I'm like, that ain't this pastor. <laughs> I'm like, I wanna be a good steward. I wanna get people ready. I wanna make sure I'm doing everything that I can to cultivate an environment of growth. But do you know what? I need faith people in my life who will call me to believe God for something I can't see. But then hyper faith people, they need reality people so they don't dismiss people's pain. Because hyper faith people, and it's, it's, it's needed, but hi, like hyper faith people, right? Like I remember growing up, like, you know, people like, I ain't sick. Bro, you just threw up 10 times. <laughs> nope, I'm not letting the devil know I'm sick. I ain't saying I'm sick. Devil ain't blind. He saw you throw up. He knows that's not normal. He knows you're sick. It's not a shock. So you need, like, so then sometimes hyper-faith people need to be grounded, but, y'all, this, this is, like, what's really going on. And that's why I love when, in Romans 4, when Paul is talking about to the church in Rome, and he's talking about how Abraham, like, got this promise from God. And he said, hey, you're going to have a child and, you know, you're going to have a child. We didn't know when he was going to have it, but he was 100 years old. And his body, this won't before Noah day. So this won't know six to 800 years old, people. This is like normal 125 years old. You like dying, right? He's, he's 100 years old. Some things ain't work no more if you get what I'm saying. <laughs> Unless they had some real strong pills back in the day, you know? <laughs> there wasn't going to be a supernatural miracle. There's going to have to be action. You know what I'm saying. But I just totally lost track of what I was saying. Okay, so what it says, though, what Paul said in the book of Romans chapter 4 about Abraham, he said, Abraham did not deny the fact that his body was dead, but he did not waver in unbelief regarding the promise of God. He said, Abraham defined reality without losing his faith in God. You see what I'm saying? Both and. We need hyper faith people that believe God for anything. We need people that define reality. But we need to be growing in the one that we're not. Does that make sense? And the church needs both. Some of you, you have the gift of faith. I know people, you have the gift of faith. When you walk into a room, 
faith of the room shifts. You walk in, God can do anything. You have people that walk in, though, and they see needs and what people are actually in right now. Y'all, we need both. We don't need to fight. This is called the body of Christ. We need each other. We need the gift of faith. We need the gift of what scriptures, or the, in Romans 12, 15, it says, mourn with those who mourn. And so when it comes to this idea, what, what, what do we got? We got grieving and what? Hope. Grace and truth, faith and reality, grieving what Paul says with hope. I don't know about you, I'm a hope guy. So me, I'm like grieving and processing emotions. I'm just like, man, God's word says this. Da, 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 da. Guess who I got married to? A griever. <laughs> it's my wife feels so deeply. And that's such a gift because she feels people's, people's pain and she, you know, and, and, and so what I did for many years is I would try to scripture verse her and over, and you know, when, when she was walking through something, I'd be like, well, God's word says, and she would say, John, stop pastoring me. <laughs> I was just trying to share some hope. <laughs> But what I realized is at that moment, she needed someone to mourn with someone who was mourning. Grieving with someone who was grieving. She has helped me lean in to people's feelings and what they feel. Because I'll stay over here and hope, give scriptures, give encouragement, <laughs> preach a sermon to you. I'll give you hope, but a huge part to her, but just, just through me wanting to be a holistic follower of Jesus, I've leaned into my feelings and my emotions. And it's been so healthy because I've had to grieve things I didn't even know I needed to grieve. And so, because here's the thing, if, if you don't learn how to grieve, you'll never be able to grieve with those who are grieving. You cannot help someone in a part of their journey if you've never walked through it. And that's what I'm saying. Your healing and your journey is never just about you. It's about what the Lord will do in you and through you and for you. But then how's he going to use it? You use it to walk someone else through. And so, so learning to, you know, but then too, you have people that are deep grievers, but then they won't lean into hope. And, and so let me give you a couple thoughts here, right? In closing, I promise. Um, if you grieve with no hope, your loss will probably define you. Do you feel that? If you only are in one end of the spectrum, right, grieving with no hope, you'll pr that, that's what happens is now the loss in your life literally becomes your reality and defines you. But here's the thing. If you hope with no grieving, you'll have the right answers but bypass, but bypass a God-given process to help you heal at the deepest levels. Do you, you see what's going on here? Grieve and hope. Hope and grief. You're going to have a home base, but the Lord invites you not to just do either or, but to both and. And there are some of you here today, you are in a season, a sacred season of grieving, and what the Lord is inviting you into is saying, not to bypass what you feel, but to invite the voice of hope into your grieving. Some of you are hope people, you know the word, you got the right theology, you know what the Bible says, but you are denying a season of grieving because you don't even want to do it because you're scared of it or you theologically struggle with loss. Everyone doing okay? And if we're gonna be healthy, holistic, emotionally healthy followers of Jesus, a part of our journey with Jesus is gonna be learning how to process and navigate seasons of loss. And what the Lord invites us into, here's the, here's the thing, is to grieve with hope. God invites us to grieve with hope. Feel the feelings, but feel them in light of God's word, truth, character, and promises. Is this good, is this good news? We have an example. Jesus gives us permission. But the, then we see we have a path here. And, and here's the thing, but like I said, that path isn't just gonna be from A to B. It's probably gonna be but my heart for our church is that we would have a church that accepts the process of grieving as a sacred season from the Lord. 
not just something we push through and bully through to get over it. But we say, Lord, you can meet me here. You can walk me through this. And that's why I love when it, when it says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of what? You are what? With me. In your lowest time, your depth of your deepest loss, I want you to know the Lord is with you. Stand up with me. Come on. That helpful to you today?